Good afternoon, everybody. It is almost 12 noon. I've been in here for too long, but it's because my brain did not want to fire up and I wanted to do a separate video for how to Hagi, or as the Dutch would say, Hoogie, and it's May 3rd. In this section, we are going to talk about how to Hugi in nature. And my side note is always be prepared, check the weather, and take food or drink. That little side note is for if you decide to go out for a hike in nature. And I underlined sections that I thought was prevalent to this video. But it says here, let's start with the basics. Always be prepared and do your homework. Check the weather forecast before venturing outdoors. Now, the reason why she says this is because the factor in her home territory of Norway, even though she lives in London right now, the weather can change at a moment's notice. So always be prepared. Um, she did, I didn't underline it, but she did go to talk in part of this, that when she wants to go clear her head in London, even in the middle of their colder seasons where it's wet and dreary and sometimes can be somewhat snowy, she'll don on um, a sweater over her, her clothes wrap a scarf around her her neck and face and then don on a heavy coat and go out for a walk in the crisp air. Um, which is kind of interesting because Norwegians, for the most part, I am learning, are hardy people and they don't care what the weather is. They will go out for a walk in the middle of winter donning on a pair of skis for cross-country skiing or a pair of snowshoes for just walking through the snow, um, they're always prepared. They're, they're, like I said, the weather can change at a moment's notice. I mean, literally you could be, it could be nice and sunny and then snap your fingers and it could be snowing at any given time of the year, depending on your altitude, which can be said for the same thing here in the Northwest part of the United States. I mean, from what I understand, the climate or, or, um, Alt climate altitude and forestry is almost the same as like Washington or Oregon State, um, possibly even Montana. Um, but anyhow, she also goes to say in here, and I underline this, invest in a pair of comfortable outdoor boots that are sturdy and have a good grip. And that's basically if you're in the in the mountain ranges where you're you're trying to climb over rocks or walk up, walk a, a, a game path or trail up a mountain, you want a good pair of shoes that are basically going to keep your ankles from twisting or um, keep your feet from slipping off of a moss-covered rock. Um, I always suggest when you go for a walk, especially if you're living in mountainous terrain where they have mountain lions and bears and bobcat and other various predatory animals that might misconcept you, you as a, a prey or food, basically. You want to have that walking stick to make noise and make you look bigger than you really are to cause some of the, the predatory animals to go, no, no, that's too big. I'm not going to try. It's too big. It's too noisy. I'm not going to try to take it down. The other thing, especially here in America, which we still have a lot of predatory animals, um, Norway and whatnot don't have... They have their their various, you know, lynx, bobcat, don't know about bears anymore or anything like that, but most of the predatory animals in their, in their territories are less than, less in number than, than here in the States. It's always go, good to go in a group. And then she goes to say that, um, it's, uh, she basically says that she has a pair of Timberland boots, but she, which are 20 years old. She's got boots that have lasted for 20 years, which is actually pretty good. And Timberland is a good product. Um, I had, and I don't know why I got rid of them, a pair of Wolverine um, hiking boots. Um, probably because of the fact I wasn't using them for hiking. I was using them for work because they were, not, they were slip resistant. And they just got kind of cruddy and trashy because of, food and junk and whatnot falling on them while working. Um, but she also goes to tell us, um, 
don't have to go crazy. Don't have to go get the, the name brand high level $120 shoes. Um, now back when she got these 20 years ago, Timberlands were probably right there on the mid level of expense wise. But let's see here. Um, also basically she says, make sure your cell phone is fully charged before you set off and have a Swiss army knife. Always useful. Swiss army knife. Yeah, I can understand. Um, charging my phone. Well, the problem with having fully charged cell phones is even though a fully charged cell phone can have satellite um, reception for um, GPS, but a lot of cell phones um, in, here in America, when you get out into the wooded areas out in the middle of nowhere, have little to no reception for phone calls. It, yeah, it will have the GPS tracker and whatnot. So like if I were to go out in the woods without my wife, and I was gone too long, she can easily track my location. Um, she also says uh, a hip flask is handy for an uplifting dram, which is basically a drink, a sw uh, swig, uh, while out and about. Now, you can buy these hip flasks that are part of a um, hip belt system or pouch system that has a water bottle you can put water most people would put water in it but um a lot of the europeans will put a um a type of whiskey or something that's not it's not totally alcoholic where you're going to get tipsy but um it's got enough of a of a a smooth alcohol that's going to keep you warm uh in cold climates but I am pretty sure she doesn't mean just booze. I think she pretty much means uh, water or some sort of refreshing liquid that's not like soda or juice, but like water or Gatorade or some sort of electro ele electrolyte water, which Jerry drinks a lot. It helps keep you energized and whatnot. She also talks about bringing some delicious... I'm probably going to mispronounce this, and I'm sorry, Nelly, because I know you have um, connections to people who know these words, and I'm, I'll spell it out. Fika? Fika? Not Fika. Um, F-I-K-A. I know it's a, a, um, a Danish or Norwegian word. But it, it's basically a, a type of food that are basically snacks. So it says delicious fika, fika goodies won't go amiss either. So basically what she's saying, if you're going to go out for a walk, even if you're not taking a full-size backpack or anything like that with a lot of food, have a hip, like a um, fanny pack as we call them here in America, with a water bottle with electric white electrolyte waters or even if you want to put a little bit of um a small a small flask of uh um uh of liquor uh, or booze nothing highly intoxicating but something that's basically you take a, a nip of it or as they call it um what did she say yeah a dram which is like a small amount um to basically help keep you warm on a cold day. But she's also saying, you know, to put, pack yourself some nutritious, healthy snacks, not not chips, not store-bought stuff, but something that you might make at home. Um, and she does uh, talk about that, the, the pika, the goodies, um, the recipes in the book. But then it says, um, basically, if you want to use, if you want to take an, uh, do an impromptu picnic, um, all the better for a basket or rucksack um, with a blanket or jacket. You can use your jacket or plastic bags to have a little picnic. And it even says a decent rucksack, preferably waterproof, is ideal. Don't go crazy buying something fancy that costs an arm and a leg like I have a what the military calls a three-day rucksack which is basically 
the main pouch is a big giant open pouch and then it has three side uh, three pouches in front of it for whatever going for a hike going for a, a three-day camping trip whatnot it has um little areas that you can tie a, a um tent and sleeping bag to you know and it's it's not exactly 100 percent waterproof but it, it is thick enough to protect from basic elements um, my other bag here, which is newer, it's more of a school bag. I wouldn't use that, even though it is considered waterproof. But it's just something I wouldn't want to take um, camping. But it's probably got better ties and whatnot for all my camping gear. So maybe I would use it. I don't know. Um, you want something durable yet sensible. Nature doesn't care if you own the latest brand fashion accessories. The main thing is to invest carefully in a few useful items that will stand the test of time. There you go. Um, yeah. Let's see here. And then I have this whole section that I marked um, that she talks about. It says... Steer clear of any... Oh, this is for the foods. Okay, yeah. This is the food items that you want to take with you on a... Either a backpacking excursion or, or a, a short camping trip. Um, steer clear of any ingredients that might leave your... Okay, she's talking about sandwiches. Might leave your sandwiches soggy. Cucumbers, I'm looking at you. This is her saying that. Um, and any ingredients that might serve as bacterial breeding grounds if exposed to heat and sunlight such as mayonnaise or cream unless you have and let that up excuse me unless you bother to bring an insulated bag seafood does not really do well either and you can prove and wait a minute and can prove to be malnutritious choice as and she uses another um nordic word matpeka i'm probably spelling that i'm saying that wrong m-a-t-p-a-k-k-e fair um i'm guess it's a norwegian word for spoilage or something like that i don't know i have to look it up most of the salad, most of the salad and vegetable recipes listed in this book will serve as light nutrition, nourish, you know, light nourishment to have on your adventure in nature, and more importantly, that means you can sir, save room for that F word F, F I K A, such as. And she writes down the items and whatnot. I marked it as travel food, basically. The muffins on page 71, 75, and 88, which I'll get to in a, in a different video. Chocolate almonds and marzipan prunes on page 89. Dark and light cakes on... Dark and light cake on 83. Brown butter, sugar, and... Malt shortbread on 76 and cardamom twists on 68. I went back and I looked at those. They're just simple, quick recipes um, that she did, she has written in the book. And I'll tell you what, they sounded great, but some of the items in it was kind of like, ooh, I don't know if I can get that around here. I'll have to look at maybe a whole food store. But then we go down here and it says, try not to overcompensate things. Overcomplicate, I'm sorry, overcomplicate things. Um, and then she goes to say, steer clear of those horrible so-called health treats that value virtue, that value venue over flavor. So basically she's trying to get you to eat something that's nutritious, it has lots of good flavor, um, and they're not just 
cheap items that you can buy at your local convenience store that's packed with artificial preservatives and flavoring and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is simple no hay. Okay. There is simple no hay to be found in a flavorless mush comp comprising mush comprising chia seed dates and avocado. Not exactly 100% sure what she meant by that, but I think what she's trying to say is a lot of the convenience store nutrition um, to-go bars, like, um, darn it, I can't remember the names of some of these bar, uh, some of the things I've seen at my local convenience stores that most people grab for quick and easy on-the-go travel type snacks. Or easy to go, throw in your backpack and take on a on a, a hiking trip. It it's just one of those like what? Why would anybody want to eat those? Um, then she goes to say, a flask of tea, coffee, or any boozy, malted, creamy hot chocolate on page one forty seven is always a welcome treat when you're out and about. Not only is it more economical than relying on random cater, catering options. Basically what she means by that is your convenience store purchased items. But you can control what you put in your flask. And then she's got in brackets, booze. Well, okay, I'm... Unlike most Americans, most Europeans can handle a little bit of booze. Um, most Americans, if they, most American booze, most American alcohol, um, like Jack Daniels or Turkey Hill or those, their alcohol content is designed more to give you a buzz or a start getting you intoxicated after you have drinking a flask worth of that stuff while European alcohol, and I'm not talking about Jägermeister, I'm talking about, oh, scotch, certain kinds of brandy, um, certain kinds of, um, Definitely not anything we make here in America. Basically, no Turkey Hill, no Jack Daniels, no... None of that kind of stuff. I mean, most European booze, what we here in America would call hard liquor, like scotch and brandy, and um, there's another one that I can't, get, I can't bring to the top of my brain. They're not designed to get you drunk unless you consume more than one servings worth um they're designed to basically give you a, a a nice smooth taste and yeah brandy when i first had it was like it was smooth as it was going down and then it was like whoa there's a burning sensation um it's designed to basically give you a, a you know it's a social drink not one of those drinks that you're like just give me the bottle and i'll let and let me go type thing um, that in fact, it does, it, I can sit down and drink a glass, a substantial social amount of, of, of mead. Like I'll have a glass of mead with my dinner and it doesn't get me drunk. It does give me that warm, fuzzy feeling, but not to the point where I can't concentrate or do what I have to do. But then it also makes me go, okay, I need to take off the sweatshirt. Or the sweat jacket, I'm starting to get too... I'm getting warm type feeling. That's basically what she's trying to say is... European booze... Is meant to give you a nice... Flavor, a nice feeling, and keep you warm without... The intoxication of not being able to walk a straight line. Um, that, in fact, Europeans can handle their alcohol. Uh, let's see here. Um, but seriously, if you're... Hankering after some outdoor hagi and your family or friends aren't 
enthused by the idea they consider join then consider joining local or s local clubs or societies with people who love nature and the outdoors and plan your leisure time holiday leisure time slash holidays around these outdoor excursions at the risk of sounding like a tourist board for the nordic countries i recommend a holiday in the region look into wilderness festivals that, that allow you to join a party outdoors during the warmer months or consider looking or consider booking a cabin in a secluded area of natural beauty. Um, she goes to talk in, in here that I didn't mark about how she's seen pictures of uh, cabins in Canada and various different to, uh, different activities or whatnot in her in the European co countries. Like I said earlier, she was born and raised in Norway, but she is currently living in, or as of when she wrote this book, she was living in un in London. Um, I almost said London. Maybe that's the proper pronunciation, London. Um, I don't know. But, um, okay, she goes down here to say, the Germans have a great expression for this. I'm not going to try to say the German version because the only word that I could say in the German version was blau, which is the German word for blue. But the translation, which literally means we're traveling into the blue and implies that there is no clear destination or purpose to our, to your journey. It's simply, it's, simply about getting out, enjoying the scenery, and discovering something new. Well, I like that, because there are times where people ask me, so where do you want to go to get away? Jerry Ann, specifically, where do you want to go to get away? And a lot of times I'm like, I don't know, because I'm not looking for a, a destination unless I know I can afford to do what I want to do at that destination. Like right now until May 30th, Muskegee, Oklahoma is having their Renaissance fair. And I saw one of my, one of the various people I view on TikTok was talking about their setup, their tent basically for the Muskegee Renaissance Fair. Like, come in and see my wares. See if there's anything that you want. And this person is of Norse idealism. And she has a lot of, or I, don't know, I can't remember if it was a he or she. They, I'm just going to say they, had a lot of different Nordic or Norse pagan type um, stuff to buy. And I'm like, I want to go, not only because of the fact that supporting another, a fellow Norseman, but I can probably find a couple items, you know, probably going to be a little costly, that I would love to purchase to help decorate my new, new office. Are we going to go? I don't think so. I think our plans for this month have already been solidified by going to the graduation in, um, oh, in, in Illinois. Granted, we did look at it and go, oh, it's about a four to six hour drive, depending on traffic and tolls from here to there. So I'm like, darn it. It's not a 100% no, but still at the time, I, I think, I think uh, Jerry's reason why I'm saying no is so we can conserve money. Um... One of the other lines that I underline is you'll find that you sleep better when you've been, when you've had some fresh air in the evening time. Basically what she's talking about is Vector, she goes for walks um, in London in the evening time. She wraps herself up in the coat, scarf, and sweater that I talked about earlier to go for a nice little walk in her area of London. Um... 
In fact, she even says uh, the day that she wrote this it, in Bloomsbury, London, it was a chilly, crisp 39 degrees with drizzle. And she dressed up in a, a wool sweater, a scarf, a hat, and her warm coat. And then went out for a walk for 20 minutes. In this brisk, cold, 39 degree, drizzly weather in London. And I was like, dang. And here I am complaining about how cold it gets around here. Yet I could do the same thing she does. Bundle up and go for a walk. I've gone for walks around my little neighborhood. Granted, it's not in nature. And London does not have a lot of nature unless you go out of London. They have a lot of parks and whatnot with trees and whatnot, which is close to being Hagee. Um, but anyhow, there is also, an, uh, I also line, underlined, um, there is no need to always chase the latest fashionable fitness trend. In other words, you don't always have to go to the gym to get your, your exercise, your whatever it is you're going to the gym for. Um, basically a theme that she'll re, re, she'll re turn to in a different chapter. Um, introduce children to nature at a young age. Um, and she uses a, a word that I'm, I can't say, and I'm not going to try to, but the translation means kindergarten. Uh, we had lessons. Oh, basically when she was in kindergarten, she had lessons outdoors and learned about the surrounding plants and wildlife. Um, of course, I, I left a cliff note to myself to look for activity groups, groups that go out and enjoy nature. She goes on, uh, she goes to say, nature can teach children about the importance of some symbiosis in an ecosystem and our relationship with the environment. She also goes to state, nurture your children in nature, teach them about risk and about adventures and about facing their fears. That's the Nordic way. Well, I appreciate she says that because Factor, it's what they do in, in the Nordic territories. Um, I think if I had children and I lived a little bit further out of town and closer to nature or even on weekends, if I had kids, I would take them, take my kids to go for a camping trip so they can learn to enjoy camping in the outdoors and then take them into the forest surrounding the campsite and teach them about what I know of nature and maybe even learn more myself. I'm not, I want to stop there. Um, because I spent a little bit too much time away from my wife and I'm getting hungry. But tomorrow, we will get into bringing nature's Hagee indoors. And there's a lot. Um, that will be the end of that particular chapter. And then Wednesday, if I'm filling up to it, we'll get into chapter two, which is Outdoor Pursuits. Now, she nor I are trying to tell you how to live your lives. We're giving you pointers, or I'm giving you pointers from her book on the different things that you can do to enjoy nature and live Hugi. I'm not going to say the, the English version of that word. I'm going to start trying to use more of the Nordic version or Danish, however you want to put it. But Hugi is one of those things that I think we all need. We need to learn how to live happy. We need to learn how to get back to our natural roots, which is going back to nature and enjoying the outdoors. I just hope, as somebody who advocates trying to, to do what I learned from Yellowstone National Park, and what I learned in National, Yellowstone National Park, and I think it was more because it was a park, but I think we should do it all the time, is if you go out in nature and you bring yourself food or anything like that, 
Police your gar please police your garbage. And what I mean by that is when you go out into nature, leave only footprints. Don't leave your trash. Don't leave your cigarette butts. Now, I hope you guys don't smoke. I hate smoke. I, not that I hate smokers. I just hate the idea of somebody flinging a cigarette butt that still has enough of a of a um, spark within it, a flame within it that could cause a forest fire. Um, but yeah, when you go out in nature, just leave footprints. Take your garbage. Take all the pictures you want. Take a souvenir or two. You find a um, interesting looking pine cone or interesting looking rock or maybe you're good at gardening and you want to take something from nature that you find out there, a wildflower or whatnot, and take, bring it home and try to cultivate it in a planting pot for indoors or even in your garden if you want the wildflowers to go nuts in your garden. Um... Pick up a Audubon Society book that teaches you about the different birds and animals and plant life um, that's in your region. Do something that's not only educational, but fun and brings joy. And I, I will be honest with you, the, the times that I spent in Yellowstone National Park and the times that I went out into the backcountry or just walked around the, the area that I was living at and working at in Yellowstone, Brought, used to bring a sense of joy and a sense of satisfaction and a sense of just being alive. And that fresh mountain air, those, the, the, the nights, once I stopped whatever I was doing, stopped reading, stopped writing, whatever I was doing before bed, I had no problem sleeping. You know, yeah, the nights were cold and I, I was sleeping under... I was basically my bed was a twin size bed and I had regular sheets. I didn't have it. I didn't bring flannel sheets or anything like that for the bed because they provided a set of flannel sheets and book and pillow and pillowcase and one blanket. So my wife um, and I decided that the last time I went after I got married, um, my wife and I decided to, I had a sleeping bag. And she sewed on a couple of buttons onto the sleep, uh, outer part of the sleeping bag, and she made a duvet cover um, that is now basically hanging up like a tapestry in the craft room with wool fabric. One side was one type of design, the other side was a different, so I can flip it over. Um, and then I can take it off, when I wanted to, I can take it off the, uh, the sleeping bag and throw it in, in with my wash. And I had that over me, and that was adequate covering to keep me warm i'd open up the sleeping bag put the du duvet cover on button it connected to the buttons on the top so it wouldn't the the sleeping bag wouldn't slide down and become just a bundle at the end of the duvet cover or slip cover however you want to call it um i would fall asleep no problems i mean boom i was out cold um granted because i was from a lower elevation, they talk about elevation sickness. And basically what it is, is your body, if you don't allow your body to adjust to the oxygen level and the elevation of where your, your new location is, it could be a drag. It could cause you to feel lethargic and just not enough, not enough, not, not enough oxygen. Um, and your body has to get used to it. So it takes you, it takes the average human being roughly a week to get used to a higher elevation. Um, it didn't take me that long. It took me two or three days. And the reason why it, took, it only took me two or three days is one, I didn't really have a chance to, to just sit down and do nothing for two, for a week. Um, as soon as I got my duty station one night, I had to go in for training and I had to go in. So I didn't have the time to sit down and just relax. But I can tell you this much, if you're in Whatever region you're in, whether you're in a mountain state, a plain state, a desert state, whatever your elevation is, get out. Now, I know for a lot of people who live in the Southwest where it's like, but it's 90 degrees outside at 7 p.m. at night or higher than 90, depending on the time of year and whatnot. Yes, I can understand for a lot of desert dwellers who don't like the heat. 
and go from air conditioning to from an air conditioning building to an air conditioned car back into an air, air conditioned building um it's going to be hard for a lot of people to just go out and enjoy nature um that's why i suggest that when you get when you get the week when you get a weekend two days off try to go someplace that's a little bit cooler that's not very far in fact a lot of people who live in southern texas you guys can go to oklahoma southern oklahoma it it might be a little bit cooler won't be as hot as as houston or dallas or anything like that but it will be it will be nice to get for you guys to get out and maybe find a forested area maybe even in certain parts of northern texas has enough forested area or nature for you to to enjoy but i i even though i don't do it that often and it's kind of hard for a lot of people to go well you're preaching it but you're not practicing it well yeah because right now i'm still learning it and I, I want to try to practice it um i hope that you the viewers who enjoy this will go out and practice it um but i'm hoping the next section where i'm about ready to get into tomorrow where it says how to bring hugi into the house or bring nature into the house so you can have plants and whatnot to enjoy and maybe get a sense of of hugi or happiness um from the plants being in your house we've talked here at the house and mom's like gung-ho to do it as long as it doesn't bother her allergies well i love my mom but lately i don't know what bugs her allergies and what does not because there was one time where we had an air freshener that did not bother my allergies, but she started sneezing or having or having allergy-like symptoms, and she didn't know where it was. You know, she didn't know where it was located, the air freshener. And the air freshener had a nice um, tropical bou bouquet. Didn't bug my sinuses, so I didn't think it was going to bug hers. Sometimes I wonder, even with myself, what is actually causing some of our problems? Because it's like, all of a sudden I'm sneezing. I don't have a runny nose. I don't have any of the atypical allergy pre-sneezing pre issues. Is it psychological? Is it mom sneeze, so I sneeze? Is it like a Pavlovian response? I don't know. But she's willing to allow me to experiment with different plants and whatnot into the house. And I was explaining to mom, I said, we have a, one of, one of Jerry Ann's, uh, one of the people that Jerry Ann abused and I viewed them. And Jerry Ann and this couple is friends through, via YouTube. Um, I'm not going to get it without their name because it's not my per place to give out their particular name. Because I don't want them to have problems because negative pe people who want to be negative are like, oh, well, they're friends with this couple. Why don't we jump over to their channel and cause them issues and bitch and complain about Jerry Ann or me on their channel? Don't want that to happen. But anyhow, they, Jerry Ann got what is called a waterless um, succulent. And basically what it is, it looks like a small fern, or not a small it almost looks like a baby aloe vera plant, but it's not. And you don't have to keep it in soil. You don't have to keep it in water. You just have to rinse it off and give it a little bit of water on its leaves every so many days or so. It doesn't talk, take a lot of maintenance. And I'm like, ooh, okay. Okay, so it, it's a hardy little plant that doesn't take a lot of maintenance or soil or water or anything like that. Cool. Um, so it's literally one of the first living house plants that we have in our house that has not died because of our lack of routine or forgetfulness to check it every day. Um, but I'm loving what I'm doing. Now, I know there are people who don't love me for, for what I'm doing because of the fact that they've got for lack of better ter terminology, a piss poor outlook of life and want to try to drag people down to their level of misery, which um, w cannot or will not happen because they have never lived in my level of misery at my most 
miserable lowest point of my life. Um, that in a factor, you don't know what I've dealt with in my past. And you don't know the struggles that I deal with on a daily basis to try to keep and maintain a positive attitude when there's so much negativity out there. And I'm what, metaph not metaphysics, um, I'm what parapsychologists would call a sensitive. Basically, which means I am sensitive to my environment. I am sensitive to things that people don't see. So, like, I could be sitting in my house, and if mom or Jerry is having a bad day, I'll know it because I'll feel it. And I struggle to keep that from, from keeping me from doing what I want to do. So, when pe some people learn about this, they try to project their negativity towards me or upon me, so I'll be negative or miserable, and I've learned how to switch that off. Um, I can't totally switch it off to the point where I ignore everything, but I can switch it off to where if you're not a family member or if you're not somebody I consider close to me in one way or another, you're not going to affect me. In fact, actually what you're going to do is you're going to cause me to reverberate. Basically, I will return your negativity upon you um, in one way or another. Um, does that mean I'm letting it affect me? Yes and no. I recognize it and I go, denied, return to cinder. Um, I know a lot of people are, don't believe in metaphysics. I know a lot of people don't believe in the supernatural or the parapsychiatry of, of the world, but it's there, it's out there. There, there are actually colleges that teach parapsychiatry and psychology and anything that has to do with the paranormal. Um, a lot of people call them quacks because the fact are back before the mid 70s, early 80s, there was no scientific evidence of such things, but people still wrote books and whatnot. And I think it was like, the late 80s, early 90s, they started teaching. It started becoming more of a reality because more and more people were having unexplainable experiences. And it wasn't just like one individual having the experience. It was multiple in individuals having the same experience simultaneously. And when you have that happen, the sci scientific community goes, um, we have to look into this because there's got to be some form of explanation. And even to this day, scientists cannot fully explain it, but they do agree that it does happen. It is a reality. So to those of you who want to turn your nose up to me believing that I have certain gifts of the paranormal or parapsychology level, um, all I can say is booey on you. But anyhow, this video got a little bit longer than I wanted to, and I'm somewhat sorry, but not sorry. Um, if you enjoyed this little vlog, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and place them in the comment question comment area. Um, just be warned if I feel it is inappropriate, um, it may get removed. But for the most part, I have seen a lot of comments that are more appropriate than not appropriate. Um, I am still apologetic to, I'm sorry if I can't remember your name. I think Karen was your name. Um, you did put in a question or comment that at the time I took as inappropriate. Sorry for picking my nose. Um, and I'm sorry that I deleted it because after I spun it through my head I was like oh that was not an inappropriate it was a question not an inappropriate comment it was just a I was in a bad place when I first woke up and I just mistook it so I apologize to you Karen I'm I'm 75 percent sure it was uh, the lady's name was Karen um anyhow um, if you're new to my channel and enjoyed the 
content within this video or the other videos of the same category and you choose to join thank you very much it is your choice if you're new you can choose like i said it's your choice once you've made the choice to join me and hit the um subscribe button a little bell will pop up and you can click on that bell and you will get notifications when i put in new videos so until next time god bless good day bye